of God. In Him they are yea, and in Him they are amen. Everything that God has promised us. If it had not already came to pass, it's going to happen in a minute detail when He gets ready. So we can thank Him now. I am so grateful to present to you the speaker for the album. And since this is uh, the graduation day for the uh, evangelistic class. I give you uh, Reverend uh, Cedric Hardin. He's going to make a presentation to those graduation, graduating and then he's going to bring us the word of God. Amen. And we want you to open up your minds up, you know, you're, uh, you're, uh, to open up your mind and receive with all readiness of heart the message that Reverend Hardin have received from the Lord this morning. Amen. Reverend Hardin, we're in your hands. We certainly thank and praise God. It's not for me, it's for God. Yeah. I would not be here if it wasn't for the grace of God, but we have a Department of Christian Education here at Pleasant Green, and part of that department involves evangelism, and I am the instructor for that course. But I thank and praise God for the work that we have set out to do to win souls for Jesus Christ. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, some of you have gone through the course and what we really like to see is that you leave from the classroom if you're not in ministry to become a part of the administration of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So these students that uh, we had several people to sign up but we had two to actually complete the course and I want you to understand something about me. It's not about the numbers. It's about our faithfulness to the commands of Jesus Christ. We're gonna talk about that a little bit today, but I thank and praise God for these students. Uh, one is here today, Evan Fowler uh, is out of town. I understand Caressa Davis will be accepting his certificate. 
in his behalf, but we spend 16 weeks together. It used to be a three-year course. We rewrote the program and reduced it to 16 weeks, and we are studying what it means to win souls for Jesus Christ. And so we have, uh, from evangelism course, we have started prison ministry at the St. Louis County Justice Center in Clayton. We are currently writing some things for our community outreach program. We have substance abuse, Sister Georgia Tucker is involved with, and so we have a lot of things that we are working on, but I want you to understand something. This is not a group endeavor. Uh, Sometimes when you see people going through programs and through the, even this class, we think it's for them. Just put a big X by that. It's for you. We're gonna talk about that this morning. So we want to present our certificate today to uh, our first student, Sister Susie Beavers. Sister Beavers took uh, the first evangelism course. She came back, took the six week, uh, 16 week course. She is coming back in the fall with a recruit uh, that she has uh, uh, obtained and she wants to sit through the course again with her recruit. So let's praise God for that. And accepting for Evan Fowler is Sister Carissa Davis. Caressa Davis. God bless you. If I don't do this, I'm going to get in trouble. I want to acknowledge my wife, um, Evangelist Linda Hart. Won't you stand? We work together. Uh, in rewriting the program for this church and she is very instrumental some of the things we are doing we have not launched yet but uh, my wife and I have uh, undertaken some other things that we're rewriting for this church to see us go forward uh, not just in these walls but outside of these walls so I want to thank her for her efforts And we want to acknowledge today our own coordinator, <laughs> Sister Winnell Landers. Let me tell you something about this lady. She is extremely passionate about this evangelism structure for this church. I've watched her smile, laugh, and I've watched her cry about her passion over this program. And so I want you to know you have someone who is extremely faithful to this endeavor. And so we want to just acknowledge you today with this token. Now, you didn't know. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, we'll get it. Thank you all. with the message today uh, to talk to you a little bit about evangelism and why it is so critical, not just for Pleasant Green, but for the body of Christ at large. So get your Bibles in your hand. I'm gonna give you some scriptures and we're gonna spend a few minutes just talking about some things that we, we need to be concerned about. How many of you know this church is in decline? Do you see that? Yes. All right. Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Eternal God, we come in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for just giving us instructions and commandments on how we need to go forward. We thank you for 
this congregation. We thank you for every family that is represented here today. And we just pray that you would guide us in the way that you would have us to go. Don't let us leave the same way that we came. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I came from, before I came to this church, I came from a church that many of you know as a storefront. Uh, we didn't have a lot of resources, we didn't have a lot of members, but we had a lot of faithfulness. And I will tell you this about me, whether it is two students or 60 students, we will continue to teach evangelism to this church. We are committed to being faithful to the commandments of Jesus Christ, but I want to share a couple of scriptures with you today. I want to begin in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, and then we're gonna go over to Romans chapter 10, verses eight through 10. Just give me a few minutes and I just want to talk to you about what we are doing in evangelism. And I hope that uh, you all will, if you're not a part of this church, uh, you are a part of another local congregation, get involved. We, it, let me say this to you. We have a lot of people attending, but we don't have a lot of people that are involved in ministry. We have a lot of people that are attending, but they are not working in the ministry of Jesus Christ. We have a lot of people in attendance, but we do not have a lot of people who are concerned about the unsaved. If I could give you a word in place of evangelism, it would be reproduction. Because you all will agree, and it's not just limited to Pleasant Green that we are in decline, it's happening to a lot of local churches. Uh, uh, and there's a reason for that, but the Christian's response is evangelism. We are mandated to reproduce what we are. And we're going to talk about that today. If you have your Bibles, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. If you're able to stand, please do that. It won't keep you long. I know where your mind is. I know you got the grill ready and you need to put a bone or two out there. Right? But we got to get this word in before we go. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, if you have it, say amen. amen. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Catch this. And he who wins souls is wise. Turn now to Romans chapter 10. I want to go down to verse 8. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. The Bible says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You might take your seat. I'm using for a thought today, winning souls. And I want to raise this question to you, because I know you've heard that term. What does winning a soul mean? What does winning a soul mean? If you connect these two scriptures, and there are others if you do your homework, 
specifically in Romans, the Apostle Paul takes a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 30 to raise this question about winning souls. One of the things that we have to understand, there's a lot of work involved in winning a soul. Those of you that are working with somebody that you, that you want to, to, to give their life to Christ, what are you looking for? We have the answer in Romans chapter 10, to win a soul means to win the confession unto Jesus Christ. And we have to put our work in, and until we win that confession, we still have work to do. And these are the principles that we are teaching and that we are learning in terms of this culture that we are living in is how to get that confession. Don't say man, just learn something today. If we are not going to reproduce what we are so as to win the confession, what will Pleasant Green look like in another year? If it's in decline already, what will Pleasant Green look like in another two years? If we don't reproduce what we are, what will Pleasant Green look like in five years? We cannot keep taking from the kitty and never putting anything back. Am I making any sense? Don't complain about the decline Put something in the kitty. So the ministry can sustain itself. We are a historically older congregation. Is that right? So when the older congregation goes from labor to reward, who will take their place? If you are, I saw the uh, blessing of the child this morning. The hope of a parent regarding their children is to see those children go beyond what they have done. If you don't teach them anything, they'll never be able to make it beyond what you are. So it is in ministry. There has to be, we had a pastor who retired. Is that right? But there has always been somebody here standing in the gap. The reason why is because the men behind me have prepared themselves. And any one of them can go forward because of the preparations that they have made in their lives. So it doesn't matter when I sit down one of them is going to get up. One of the things that I, I don't usually use props during messages I preach, but I wanted to bring along the textbook that we are using in this course. It is a 1999 print, 
but is, it is very relevant to what we are trying to teach. Terry A. Bolin is the author, and the title of this book is Make Disciples, Reaching the Postmodern World for Christ. Postmodern? What does that mean? There are periods, as I said earlier, that are going to come after this period. One of the things that, that, that we are trying to teach and to learn is the, the culture that we are living in. I know we want to say something about Jesus, but you need to learn what you are dealing with. You need to know the audience that you are dealing with. We need to know the people that we are dealing with, their habits, their traits, their callousness. The more that we bring on youth, no offense, but youth today are much more callous than they used to be. They are so-called harder. Some years ago, uh, when we had the uprising in Ferguson, some of the funeral directors came here. You all saw it on television, but what, what, what the uh, funeral directors was telling us was that some of the young people were already making their funeral plans. They want to live fast and die hard. Well, when you die, you just die. But they want to die hard. How are we going to reach our young people? Some of the methods that we are learning in this book or that other ministries have used the so-called confrontational method, they don't work anymore. But to win a soul for Jesus Christ takes time. You and I must become prepared to deal with our culture, to deal with our community, to deal with our society. Reverend, what does that have to do with ministry? You ought to read Jesus' account. But on the back of this book, I'm not going to go inside of it because it's so much. But the very heading on the back of this book says the joy of seeing people come to Christ. Then Terry Bolin asked a question. A cynic once asked, what in the world are you Christians doing? You got to get some insight into where he is going with this. What are we doing? What is our role as a church? What is our role as evangelists? What is our role as witnesses? If you did your homework, you will find that uh, uh, only a small percentage of this church actually lives in this community where this church sits. So that makes us what they call a commuter church. So that means we come from various distances to this church, but we don't actually live in the community. And when you approach somebody that lives in this community, they know you don't. 
So the question to you would be, you don't even know what I'm going through. So how are you going to approach somebody that lives in this community that you don't? I'm trying to help somebody. I'm not telling you to sell your house and come down here. I'm telling you to get to work. This book has been divided into three sections. I'm almost through. I can see the grill up now. <laughs> Dealing with the aspects that describe disciple making in the Great Commission. Let me say something about that. All of the, we use Matthew 28, 18 through 20, but all the gospel writers agree that you can't evangelize sitting still. All of them agree. It's something that we have to do. And one of the first things that Terry Bolin deals with is the word go. I'm going to add something to that. Don't go. If you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're dealing with, you don't know Jesus, you don't know how to win a soul, a win a soul then I'm going to say, don't go till you learn. Then go. Yeah. I'm not picking on you. I'm concerned. Huh? I'm concerned about the death toll. I'm concerned about all of the other things that are going on in our community. We are learning about the housing issue. We, we are looking into those areas. And you might notice how some of the communities have literally been blighted. We did some study for St. Louis Christian College where, uh, uh, John, so many people, the only people that are really staying in our communities now is our elderly. The reason, by, reason uh, why is because they have lived in, they, in their houses long enough and they have paid for them. So they have an investment in the community. But it's hard to get businesses to come into these areas. And some of us, when we get two or three nickels, we gonna get out of it. You know, we need a better neighborhood to live in. I got that. But somebody gonna have to stay here. And somebody gonna have to roll up their sleeves. And somebody's going to have to go and ask the basic question in evangelism is, do you know Jesus in the part of your sin? But this outline about go raises biblical understanding of evangelism and the difficulties and opportunities encountered as we take the gospel to our postmodern, post modern post Christian culture. One of the things that John's here, he'll tell you, one of the things that we are really trying to learn, uh, even from uh, the policing aspect, is what we're dealing with. Where are these target areas? Where do we have these spikes in crime and, and all of these other things that are unsavory? But the church has to take a stand. And we have a mandate from Jesus Christ himself. He says, go and make disciples. Reproduce. One of the questions, Lena, we ask in evangelism, if we're going to reproduce, then we got to raise another question. What would another you look like in the church? Right. 
if we duplicate you, clone you, what would two of you all look like in the church? I'm trying to help somebody. If you win five, so what would five of you look like? Those would be the people that take your place. In the second section, baptize. The author brings together our understanding of the Bible and our society to determine what methodology will help us to maximize our efforts in carrying out the Great Commission. I, I, I don't usually do this, but I, I shared a post on Facebook, on my page. It was a baptism service in Williams Creek, somewhere in Colorado. They baptized 543 people at one time in the creek. And there were at least two individuals per candidate so they could help them go down in the water. But I was thinking about what kind of evangelistic effort would that have taken? How much work would have gone into witnessing to that many people and securing a confession unto baptism? And as far as your eye could see, all of their family members were just gathered around on the bank and they baptized 543 people. One of the things that bothers me about church people, they don't dream. You know, you, don't you dream? If you go outside, can't you see the stars? Can you see the moon? In other words, don't you see that we could make a difference if we went to work? We could also bring 543. What would that look like in this church? Sister Jeanette, tell me. Could this church hold another 600 people? Some would have to go up in the balcony. Some might be standing around. I'd be satisfied with one. And the Lord, all right. The third section also examines the biblical model of accepting Christ as Savior and shares numerous approaches for sharing biblical teaching. That's very important. One of the things that we teach in, e in evangelism is to stay away from isms. There's a lot of, and a lot of them, in, even in this book, are organized isms. There are other things being taught to our culture, and, and, and they are not biblically based. You know, if, 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 if Terry Boland did not give scripture with his uh, uh, book, we couldn't use it. And then he has to be in context with the Bible. Otherwise, we can't use it. So we teach the students to stay away from these isms. If you look at Paul's writing here, and this is just one example of an ism. 
uh, in this context here in Romans chapter 10, in talking about being saved, one of them is by works. You got to watch that because people are trying to earn their way into the kingdom. You know, by something that they have done. You're going to miss the mark. The other principle away from ism is of faith. That's what we preach. We have our work cut out for us. We also have to emphasize the importance of follow-up structure. I want to make a point about that and then I'm going to give you one scripture and then I'm going to my seat and you can get on to the sweet baby rays. But when people come to Christ, let me say this. One of the problems, and we, we have looked at the numbers that have walked away from this church. And the question came up, did we do an effective job of nurturing them? It's all right for somebody to come down and even after I'm done today and, and we extend an invitation and you come down and you give your life to Christ, that is just the beginning of the nurture process. Somebody is going to have to spend time with you. Another question we ask John is what is evangelism going to look like in your life with your busy schedule? All of us that work have other commitments. Then we add evangelism to the mix and you might be overwhelmed. So we need to consider what would this look like if I start obeying Jesus Christ? How much time can I spend with and for the unsaved? Because it doesn't take us too long to get too busy. And then the, the assignments that we accept we subsequently walk away from. Or you learn anything today. I'm talking about soul winning. That is the mandate of Jesus himself. I want to read something to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This will take quite a bit of study on your part. And it may not make any sense to you reading it today, but I want you to read these scriptures, these verses when you get home, and, and look at what the Apostle Paul is saying here, what he did with his life. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 19. Paul says, For though I am free, from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And we're talking about that winning again, or to bring people to Christ. Verse 20, and to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Verse 21, to those who are without the law, or the Gentiles, as without law, not being without the law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. Look at verse 22. To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. 
I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. You, you know, this puts your life into perspective. If you are living your life and it's all about you, it's all about what you want to get, where you want to go, how much you want to obtain, you are missing some principles about your creation. You are missing the principles by which Jesus saved you in the first place. It was never about you. Jesus didn't come to save his life. He came to save your life. And you ought to spend some of your life helping somebody save their entire life. We only ask you for 16 weeks. Huh? That's all we're asking for. But look at verse 23, and I'll be through. Now, this I do for the gospel's sake. I want to just stop right there for a minute. We ought to make sure that if nothing else gets promoted, nobody else gets promoted. Nobody else gets, gets any increase. Nobody else gets a title. Nobody else gets a fancy seat. We ought to make sure that the gospel is promoted. Huh? All of you, all of us, should be working on your legacy. In other words, what are you leaving somebody else? They're going to fight over that material stuff when you, when you check out. But I'm not talking about that. That's relevant too. But we ought to do something in the lives of God's people that the gospel is promoting. If you are a father, if you are a husband, you ought to make sure that your family has been exposed to Jesus Christ. Huh? If you are a parent, you need to make sure your children know Jesus in the pardon of their sins. Don't leave these young people without knowing the 23rd Psalm. But they know how to do the rap thing. Leave them a scripture that you know, that you can teach them, that they can quote. You know, when we was coming up, it was customary. Uh, the, my parent didn't say, uh, get over there on that bedside and pray. That's not what they did. That's not what they did. They kneeled down alongside of us. And they prayed with us. Now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die, I pray the Lord. <laughs> What does all this mean? Paul says, I did all this stuff that I may be partaker of it with you. 
Hmm? I challenge you today. Don't obey me, obey Jesus. And you'll get right to evangelism. But somebody sang a song, they said, somebody prayed for me. Had me on their mind. Took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. The preacher prayed. The deacon prayed. The parent prayed. Somebody ought to pray. I listen at these folks. They're on the news. I give them credit. They scrambling, trying to solve this issue of crime. Oh, they scrambling. The programs are rolling down. Huh? They got good intentions of stopping the crime the violence, and the bloodshed. But let me tell you something about salvation. It'll stop the crime. Huh? It'll stop the violence. It'll stop the bloodshed. Because Jesus will transform your mind. He'll transform your heart. I won't be better than you but I'll be a better quality of individual. I'll stop doing the things that is evil in his sight. But somebody, you gotta tell them about a man from Galilee. You gotta tell them. There's a man giving sight to the blind. You got to tell them that this guy Jesus is a heart fixer and a mind regulator. You got to tell them. What do you expect a sinner to do? He just acting out of his born nature. But I heard Jesus tell Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, you must be born again. You must be born again. Born of the water, born of the spirit. Truly, truly, you must be born again. But you gotta know the man in order to talk about the man. You can't witness. You can't witness to something you don't know. But I heard the word in Proverbs, I believe in the 16th chapter. This is a general principle. Train up the child in the way that he should go. You know what the Lord did for you. The baby don't know, but tell the baby. I used to do this with my children. You know, you know, they, they daddy, they say daddy got a lot of money. I had to break that up real quick. <laughs> had to break up that foolishness. Huh? Daddy got a lot of money. So I got me a legal pad. Eight and, eight and a half by left. Set the children down at the table. And I wrote it down what I had, and then I wrote down what God has done. I said, baby, let me tell you something. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I don't know where we would be. Don't give me no credit. 
Huh? They say, Daddy, but you go to work. I say, wait, 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 wait. The only reason why I went to work is because the Lord woke me up this morning and started me on my way. It always comes back to God. Uh, the scriptures is clear, Deacon. In him we live and we move and we have our being. Where's Sister Winnell at? Did you get them sign-up sheets together? I think I got them ready now. Huh? They say they've been through the course before. But let me ask you a million dollar question. What are you doing now? Get somewhere and get busy. This is an administration. There's church work. And then there's work of the church. Our business is so winning. Let me go way out on a limb. Somebody, somebody pull me, I got to go. If you don't reproduce, you you seen locks on church doors? Huh? Big old master lock on the house of the Lord. What a sad commentary that the house of the Lord is locked up. Let me tell you what happened. In most cases, we didn't reproduce. And we put all of that pressure on the pastor. Did you all see President Obama when he left office? He left office with a head full of gray hat. It's a lot of pressure on preachers. And if we don't want to reproduce, somebody gonna come put a lock on the door. Huh? It's simple math, Sister Jeanette. The overhead is bigger than the crowd. Huh? The responsibilities is bigger than our commitments. Huh? The bills are greater than your work is in the church. And at some point, it's going to get the best of the system. It's just simple math. But if we reproduce, huh? God fearing, Holy Ghost filled people, huh? We do need your tithes, huh? And your offering, huh? That's good that you can come around and put something in. But we need some workers, huh? When you get up out of that seat in a minute to come give your offering, you left the seat empty. Did you know that? Huh? But you got to do something to put somebody else where you just got up from. That's how fast we are checking out. God is calling us fast as we can keep up. I hope, trust, and pray that I've shook you just a little bit. Just a little bit. This is my life's work. Some of you, I've gotten on your nerve. I just want you to let you know there's more to come. I'll have no problem stopping you, asking you, what are you doing in the body of Christ? Where you been? What you doing? Because I'm concerned about you 
and Jesus loves you and wants us to do something, church, about all of this stuff that's going on in our world. Lawlessness is increasing as I speak. But we must become proactive in winning a soul for Jesus Christ. Deacons, won't you come as we extend this invitation to the unsaved, this is all about you. We were talking about our approach to you. If you are here today and you fit into the category that you don't know Jesus and the pardon of your sins, I want you to come right now and give your life to Christ. Don't give it to these buildings. Serve in your local church. Give your soul to Jesus Christ. And he will give you a gift that you might go to work to help somebody else. That's what it's all about. As we stand today, if you're able to stand, just stand today. I want to do something about this. And I need your help. We can make a difference if we just try. If you love the Lord, we can get this done. Won't you come? Please come. Give your life to Christ. Today, if you hear his voice, say it the Lord. Pardon not your heart.